Linux gamers have been exploding in numbers recently, and the go-to distro right now appears to be Bazite. Last month, the distro maintainers reported over one petabyte of ISO downloads, and it's actually up to two petabytes as of December 8th, and most of the traffic, according to their logs, is coming from Windows machines, indicating that a lot of Windows users are downloading Bazite as their introduction to Linux. Now, obviously, this is a lot of downloads, right? I mean, most distros are a few gigabytes in size, Bazite is a little bit heavier at 7.5 gigabytes because it has drivers and a bunch of gaming and compatibility stuff baked into the ISO, but still, that's a couple hundred thousand complete downloads at least in order to get to that level of traffic. And what's really interesting about this is none of this traffic for Bazite ISO downloads is being served through torrents. If you remember a while back, I talked about Anduin OS, which is a hobbyist Ubuntu-based desktop developed by a former Microsoft engineer that made the distro, basically riced it to look and kind of function like Windows 11 with a compatibility layer for running Office apps and some other Windows programs. And anyway, the developer of Anduin OS was getting so many direct downloads, you know, he was getting so much traffic and attention to this that when the new version of Anduis OS was released, he added a torrent download option to kind of defer some of that bandwidth. And he actually made the torrent option the recommended method to download, which is something we see with a couple of other popular ISOs. So Bazite, they're dealing with a lot of ISO traffic directly. Well, the CDNs are really doing the heavy lifting, but you know what I mean. There's no offset that's being provided by a decentralized torrent option, but they've been chugging along just fine. I mean, it would be interesting to see how many people actually stick with Bazite, assuming that they are downloading it from a Windows machine as their first distro. It's definitely a good fit, I'd say, if you're a newbie and you want something that's gaming ready and has everything kind of prepackaged in. I mean, again, that's part of the reason why the Bazite ISO is almost twice as big as other JustWorks distros like Ubuntu or Mint. Bazite is also an immutable OS, which might help a bit with stability. I mean, basically the idea is you can't edit your system files and accidentally break something or malware can't break system files on purpose. So again, probably some good features to have for new users that don't want to do system config changes and accidentally break their install. Now, there's also been an upstream announcement about the Linux kernel, which will affect all distros, and that is the successful end of the kernel Rust Linux experiment, which is a top tier bait title. I mean, I don't think it was really intended this way, but that's obviously how a lot of people took it and kind of how I took it at first, because you would think that, you know, what's happening is that Rust is no longer going to be used in the kernel, right? It's like the experiment is done. We're not doing this anymore. But no, what's actually happening is that Rust code in the Linux kernel is no longer going to be treated as experimental. So the experimental tag is going to be coming off and Rust commits and any new drivers or features that are written in Rust should just be accepted into the kernel as, or at least with the same amount of scrutiny that the ones written in CR. So yeah, in other words, the Rust experiment was seen as a success and we might start seeing a rapid increase in Rust-based code, you know, Rust-based drivers added to the kernel. Currently, there are just a handful of Rust-based drivers in the mainline kernel. And of course, this is devastating news for people who just want to avoid running Rust code on their systems at all. I mean, I guess the BSDs and Temple OS are really the only places you can go now to avoid the crab because Windows and Apple and Android are all using Rust. But personally, I think this is great. I've never written a device driver, I mean, I have to admit, in any language, but Rust does seem like it would be a good fit for that, especially with the insistence that so many institutions and people are having on safer code. I mean, that's pretty much the main selling point of Rust this whole time and why it's gotten this level of acceptance, um, not just in Linux, but in general. One thing I do wanna point out though, that's potentially a risk with the Rust adoption. I mean, I'm not sure if this is necessarily more of a risk with the way that drivers written in C and C++ that are added to the Linux kernel are. But anyway, um, it's 
the fact that a lot of software that's written in Rust, especially Rust rewrites, like if you think of UUtils compared to the GNU core utils, they're generally licensed under MIT and Apache licenses. The Rust programming language itself is licensed this way, and you don't necessarily have to license your code that way. I want to make that clear. You can write GPL Rust code, but MIT and Apache, that's what the Rust Foundation recommends to Rust developers for maximum compatibility. So it's basically a just do the same thing that everyone else is doing type deal. And Apache and MIT licenses are more permissive than GPL. So there is actually a, I guess, functional reason for this. Um, and that's also why when corporations talk about how much they like open source and open source software, they specifically mean open source software that's MIT and not GPL, which is copy left. So for example, an MIT license lets a corporation or anybody for that matter, take open source code and then make proprietary extensions to it that make the program better or add a new feature or really whatever. But eventually if it's better and it's getting more features, and there's a corporation that's behind this change, then eventually they're gonna release their own version of that program or that driver that is completely proprietary. And so in the case of a driver in the Linux kernel, that would be something like a binary firmware blob that you can install, but you don't really know what that version of the software is doing. It just, I mean, it seems to work well, right? Like if you think of NVIDIA drivers, for example, um, it works well until it doesn't, and now this company is the only one that can fix it. Not to mention, you have no idea if this piece of software is gathering data from your device for marketing or some other nefarious purpose. There's no way for you to really know because it's no longer open source. And Microsoft actually had a name for this strategy of, I guess, conquering open source software. The strategy was called embrace, extend, extinguish. And the copyleft licenses like GPL are designed to defend against that kind of corporate takeover. You know, it's already hard enough, if you think, to get modern hardware working on Libre Linux. Like this is some, an interesting experiment to try out. Try running a fully Libre Linux distro like Triscoll or PureOS, right? So these are distributions that use the Libre Linux kernel, which basically means there's no proprietary blobs and there's no proprietary firmware that ships with that kernel. And one of the main pain points you'll run into there is, especially if you have a laptop, getting Wi-Fi and Bluetooth to work because a lot of the default cards that come in these laptops that you buy at the store just are not compatible. Obviously you can swap those out, but it's an extra thing you have to do, right? It's like now in order to get your operating system to work, you also need to have a level of hardware competence to disassemble the laptop and replace the cards, which uh, can be quite a pain to do on certain laptop brands. And then of course there's limitations for the higher level software, because again, just like drivers for the graphical apps you use, a lot of those also end up getting developed with MIT or you know other open source, but not copyleft licenses. But anyway, hopefully some of these driver developers, these you know future Rust driver developers, see the altruism in using GPL licenses for that code going into the Linux kernel instead of what the Rust Foundation recommends, especially for low level things that are gonna be critical to keeping Linux itself free and open source. One last thing I wanna show you guys is a fairly new program called iDescriptor that makes using iPhones with Linux a lot easier. So this is another one of those pain points if you're an iPhone user using Linux. I Probably a pretty niche group of people. But anyway, this program is available as an app image and it's available in the AUR. It's also available on Windows and Mac. And basically, a lot of the features that Apple tries to keep in their walled garden, like managing the files on your iPhone through your computer, uh, AirPlay, network discovery, and an SSH terminal on your device if it's jailbroken, uh, that can now be available to you if you're running a Linux desktop. So yeah, much like the Libre AirPod software that we looked at a while back, this is trying to bridge that huge gap of iDevice compatibility with Linux and really anything that's not Apple. I mean, I know this is available for Mac, but 
you know, if you're using a Mac and you've got an iPhone, you probably already have a lot of these things more seamlessly built in. But it's also beneficial for Windows users, obviously. I remember how difficult it was to manage an iPod Touch on Windows years and years ago. And I did eventually find some third-party app like this to use. So if you have somehow dipped your toe into the Apple ecosystem, I mean, maybe someone bought you an iPhone or something for Christmas and you started using it instead of selling it or regifting it, iDescriptor might actually be able to save you from going full Mac user. So links to the software will be in the description. Like and share this video to hack the algorithm and have a great rest of your day.